Good morning and a really warm welcome to you all to our service on the, of the word on Sunday the 7th of March, the third Sunday of Lent. Hopefully you've all had a copy of our notice sheet through the email system. There are a few paper copies in church as well if you'd like to go and fetch one. There's just a couple of things I want to draw your attention to. Firstly, we have our coffee after the service this morning and on Wednesdays. If you wish to join us, the Zoom links are in the notice sheets. And it's not too late to join our Lent course on Thursday evening either. And again, the link for that is in the notice sheet. It'd be lovely to see you at that. Our Digest magazine is also out this week. Please go and collect your copy or you may have it delivered. And inside you will find a Palm Cross ready for Palm Sunday at the end of March. And now I have an announcement to make. We are delighted to announce the appointment of Becky to the post of assistant curate following her ordination in June. The bishop has asked us to host her and so she'll be living and working here in Pakefield and her placement church will be All Saints and St Margaret's which is just wonderful. Here is a picture of her with Lee her husband and their children Kimberly, Jonathan, Nicola and Madeline. So please keep them in your prayers as they prepare to move to Pakefield. Let's just pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for the calling that you've put on Becky's life. And as she prepares to make her move to us, be with her and the family as she finishes her studies and prepares for ordination and the move from Essex to here. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Loving God. We gather as your family around your word. Fill us with the Holy Spirit as we sing your praises, hear your truth and ask for your help. We pray that we may know you better and love you more for your name's sake. Amen. Let's have our first hymn, Just As I Am.
Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. Let us confess our sins, remembering before God the times when we have fallen from temptation into sin. Wash away all our iniquity and cleanse us from our sin. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Against you only have we sinned and done what is evil in your sight. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Create in us a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within us. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. May the Father forgive us by the death of his Son and strengthen us to live in the power of the Spirit all our days. Amen. Psalm 19. The heavens are telling the glory of the Lord and the ferment proclaims his handiwork. One day pours out its song to another and one night unfolds knowledge into another. They have neither speech nor language and their voices are not heard. Yet their sound has gone out into all lands and their words to the end of the earth. In them he has sent a tabernacle for the sun that comes forth as a bridegroom out of his chamber and rejoices as a champion to run his course. It goes forth from the end of the heavens and runs to the very end again. And there is nothing hidden from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure and gives wisdom to the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right and rejoice in the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure and gives light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean and endures forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteousness altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, much more than fine gold, sweeter also than honey dripping from the honeycombs. By them also is your servant taught, and in keeping them there is great reward. Who can tell how often they offend? O oh, cleanse me from my secret faults. Keep your servant from sin, lest they get dominion over me so shall I be undefiled and innocent of great offence. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and shall be forever. Amen. Our first reading this morning is taken from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, beginning to read at verse 18. For the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, God decided through the foolishness of our proclamation to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks desire wisdom, but we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, 
for God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And our gospel reading this morning is taken from the Gospel of St. John, chapter 2, beginning to read at verse 13. The Passover of the Jews was near and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found people selling cattle, sheep and doves and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned the tables. He told those who were selling doves, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, what sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple in three days and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews said, this temple has been under construction for 46 years and you say you will raise it up in three days? but he was speaking about the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. May I speak in the name of God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. So I would planned to share with you this morning a little book called Mr. God, This is Anna. It had a big impact on me as a child. My dad bought it when it first came out in 1974. And I know I have a copy somewhere, but where it is, I do not know. Anyway, Google search is extremely useful in these circumstances. And I found the bit that I wanted to share. It is a true story about how Finn, the author, when he was a teenager, found a little girl around age four or five on a foggy night in November down in the East End docks in London, and he took her home to his mother. And the book describes their friendship over the next few years, until she dies in a tragic accident just before her eighth birthday. But that she accepts that she is dying. Basically, the accident happens because she is angry, righteous anger. And she is trying to rescue a kitten that is stuck up a tree. But she falls and lands on some railings. And yes, on one level, she is an ordinary little girl. Mischievous, energetic and full of questions. But as the story unfolds, you start to realise what an extraordinary little girl she is because she has insight well beyond her years. An insight that was remarkable. And this is the bit that I want to share with you. Finn writes, at five years old, Anna knew absolutely the purpose of being, knew the meaning of love, and was a personal friend of helper, Mr. God. At six, Anna was a theologian, mathematician, philosopher, poet and gardener. And you might be wondering why I've read that excerpt. Because as I was reading this morning's passage, I was reminded of it. And then I was also reminded of another child 
this time Jesus in the temple when he was 12. He stayed behind after his parents went home, baffling everyone with his insight, including his own parents. And today in our reading, he is back in the temple, lashing out in anger with those who are selling things and probably baffling people again. And sometimes we can get caught up in the, look, Jesus got angry and showed his humanness. This proves that he was 100% human. But I think sometimes in our eagerness to point this out, we forget that we don't need to prove that Jesus was a human being. And John, the gospel writer, certainly didn't. Because right at the beginning of the gospel, he writes, in the beginning was the word and the word became flesh, a.k.a. Jesus. No, what is more important here are the words that the fully human, fully divine Jesus uses. Destroy this temple in three days and I will raise it up. You see, the anger that Jesus had was justified. It was righteous anger. So often we are angry and it's anger, anger if you know what I mean. It's not justified and it certainly isn't righteous. And actually that type of anger we must come before God and repent of. You know the sort of thing I mean. If I'm out driving and especially if I've got my collar on, I know that I'm representing the church wherever I am. And so I have to be a bit careful. If someone's just cut me up, do I beat my horn? Do I shout at them? Or perhaps I become too impatient with the person in front of me at the green light. But my anger isn't righteous at all. But sometimes our anger can be righteous. Like when Anna was trying to rescue the stranded kitten that had been chased up the tree. And when we speak out against injustice and pain, it's okay to be angry about if someone has been badly hurt or badly treated because we want to put it right. And that is the type of anger Jesus has in our passage. He wants to put right what he was saying was wrong. You see, the temple goers needed sacrifices, but you weren't allowed to take your own. It would be a little bit like taking your own drink into the pub. The landlord just wouldn't let you. And the temple officials were the same. So people who wanted to worship God were forced to buy temple animals, as well as pay to go into the temple. Second, the Roman currency, which was used in everyday life for wages, for buying goods and materials, was the denarius the Roman coin with an emperor's head on it. So what was the problem? Well, the emperor claimed to be a god. So these coins were not allowed to be taken into the temple. They could only go in to the temple's outer courts. So the people had to change their money in order to buy the sacrifices and pay their taxes. Now, anyone who's been abroad will know the currency game. Shall I buy my dollars, euros or whatever today? Or shall I wait for next week? Because we never really know, do we, what's going to happen with the financial markets. And it's the same for the Jewish peasants. They didn't know how much their denarius was worth until they got to the money exchanges. So imagine you have £3.64 and you go and exchange it for some temple money. Now in February it cost 73 pence to have a temple coin. So you'd get five temple coins. Perfect. You'd go and buy your two doves to sacrifice. But today when you arrive with your £3.64 you discover 
that the temple coin is going to cost you 75 pence and you can only buy four, but you need five. So you will go along to the next table and explain your predicament. Don't worry, they say, we can lend it to you. You know where I'm going, don't you? One temple coin, you pay us back when you come next month. There'll be interest to pay though, of course, at 1,185% APR. So it'll cost you 1.18 temple coins. In other words, 89 pence at today's exchange rate. And that is how the money racket worked. You see, for the Jewish people, the money changers and lenders and sellers were essential to their worship. So they too were outraged. How are we going to buy our sacrifices? They felt they could not worship God without them. Jesus said, destroy this temple in and in three days, I will raise it up. Now, we know that he wasn't talking about the building. He was talking about himself. Jesus was saying, this stuff is in the past now. You don't need all these rituals. You don't need all these sacrifices because I am here. The Messiah is here. The presence of God is no longer hidden from you, but right here in front of you, he was saying. So stop. Because temple authority is nothing compared to God's authority. And so that scandal and challenge continues to affect us today. Sometimes we can fall into the same trap of thinking that certain things are needed in order to worship God. We feel that some things are completely vital when actually they aren't. Things that perhaps we make a huge fuss over if someone moved or changed them. And I once got into real trouble for moving something because someone felt it was really sacred, but it wasn't, not really. You see, when we think of Anna and her insights, and then the authoritative and challenging words and actions of Jesus, it should make us jump. It should make us grapple and ponder. You see, when we think of Jesus overthrowing the tables, we need to look at our own lives and think of the tables that we've created. The tables that perhaps he wants to throw over in our lives so that we don't get stuck into the same trap. So remember, be insightful. Remember, it is okay to have righteous anger. And watch out for those things that you make sacred in your life and that Jesus wants you to turn over. Amen. Let us declare our faith in God. We believe in God the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. We believe in God the Son, who lives in our hearts through faith and fills us with his love. We believe in God the Holy Spirit, who strengthens us with power from on high. We believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. The Collect for the third Sunday of Lent. Eternal God, give us insight to discern your will for us, to give up what harms us, and to seek the perfection we are promised. In Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. 
our prayers this morning. The response is, we may, may we hear you, Lord, and want to obey. And as ever, there'll be pauses for you to say your own prayers. As God has called us, so we have come to pray. We pray for the church, the body of Christ, with all its collected gifts and weaknesses. Give us the grace to recognize that in your spirit we are one and curb in us all tendency to division. May we hear you, Lord, and want to obey. We pray for the world in all its beauty and richness. Give us the desire to share our planet's food and resources, to care for its people's well-being and to foster peace and justice with all. May we hear you, Lord, and want to obey. We pray for those we love, those we see each day and those we miss. Help us to cherish one another as we live the loving way of your commands. May we hear you, Lord, and want to obey. We pray for all victims of selfish or violent acts and for those whose lives are trapped in sin. We pray for all those whose bodies and minds have difficulty functioning. Make us more sensitive to their needs. May we hear you, Lord, and want to obey. We pray for those who have died and for those who miss their physical presence. Have mercy on them. May they and we in our turn rest in the peace of your enfolding. May we hear you, Lord, and want to obey. We give you thanks for the loving example of Jesus, who was obedient even to death and strengthens us in all goodness. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. And as Jesus taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Let's have our final song, Cornerstone. blood and righteousness I dare not trust the sweetest frame but wholly trust in Jesus name my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong. 
the Savior's love through the storm. He is Lord, Lord of all. When darkness seems to hide his face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy Righteousness alone, faultless stand before the throne. Let us say together, Almighty God, we thank you for the gift of your holy word. May it be a lamp to our feet, a light to our path, and a strength to our lives. Use us to love and serve all people in the power of the Holy Spirit, in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Christ give you grace to grow in holiness, to deny yourselves, take up your cross and follow him. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. So take care, God bless and see you all very soon.